Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Paste Politics. I'm Walker Bragman here in the Paste studio with Michael Brooks, host of The Michael Brooks Show and co-host of The Majority Report with Sam Cedar and co-host of Woke Bros. Michael, thank you for being here with me. I've been a fan of your show for quite some time now. Not maybe as long as some other people, but, you know, I think you have a great... Can't all be perfect. It's my pleasure. You know, Thanks I, I thrive on imperfection. <laughs> we, all, we all should try, because we're all unbelievably imperfect. But yeah, it's good to be here, man. Of course. So, this is a great space. It, isn't it? It's really cool. Yeah. And, you know, I, people watching this uh, can't see, but behind us are all these original live uh, record presses, original presses of live recordings. Of Wait, they artists. can't see all of this? I mean, they can see it, but they can't read oh, okay. it. Oh, so, like, okay. They can't say, see, like, John Coltrane. I could get up and walk around and move my chair uh, and know, show them. Would you like me to? No, it's, it's all right. It's, it's all right. They're, they're, they're watching this. Maybe for, we could tilt you. the camera angle and show them the guitars over there as well. Oh, yeah. No, it's a really cool space. I'm sorry. I, to, you always, I don't know. Trust us. This impulse of, like, torturing the people who make this all possible. <laughs> I apologize. All right. Let's go. <laughs> so, so, Michael, you're, you're a, a political watcher. Like like myself and um, and unlike m myself, you you have amassed a, a large following with your fantastic takes on current events and foreign policy. And so I wanted to you know get into that with you a little bit today, uh, starting with the twenty twenty Democratic primary because um, it will have profound implications for the rest of the country w when a winner is. Is decided and the, the the actual election with Trump happens. So your initial take would be, I mean, my initial take, and I and look, I'm not uh, into this sort of like I, I respect people who who are and feel a need to sort of like reserve judgment and watch the process play out. But I feel like, and uh, Bill Fletcher Jr. is a brilliant writer and historian and labor strategist that I have on my show a bunch has written about like the different phases of strategy for the relationship between the left and the Democratic Party. And what's interesting is he points out, which is totally true I, it, on a policy and ideological level, is that the party has already been moved to the left in terms of you even have, you know, very centrist, very corporate oriented candidates, not all of them, but a crop of them in the Senate have moved left on questions of like Medicare for all and so on. At least that's what they're discoursing. That's what they're saying. So the next phase is how do you actually, you know, acquire power? How do you actually move into the institutions? How do you actually have like a longer term, you know, war of position, not movement, right? So I, that's to my preamble of saying I 100% support Bernie Sanders and I don't pretend to be like, oh, well, there's a lot of good options or, you know, or even somebody like, yes, Elizabeth Warren has been put forward to some great domestic policy ideas. Um, Tulsi Gabbard, actually, I upset a lot of people. I, I think there's, there's actually like legit problems with Tulsi Gabbard, but she's done some stuff on foreign policy and talking about, you know, pardoning Snowden and stuff. And 100% agree with her on that. Uh, but Bernie Sanders, in my view, if you have a left perspective, he's the candidate. Uh, and so from that perspective, I'm very pleased with how things have started. I think that he's in a very strong position. I'm actually seeing him connect uh, his domestic vision with a broader critique of U.S. militarism and foreign policy. I think he's the only candidate, actually, who, you know, as we said, we're all imperfect. I think the dude actually does have a certain um, understanding of global solidarity that does come from a form of the socialist tradition that he actually is in. Then people should really realize how significant that is. So I have other you know, stuff that I can get to. I mean, obviously jump in. But I, I, I think Sanders is in a good position. And from my perspective, if you're on the left, any type of actual left, from progressive to even quite radical uh, in a Marxist way, this is the candidate. So let me... Let me backtrack a little bit to this global solidarity because uh, there is a very global uh, right wing nationalist movement that's being spearheaded by people like uh, Steve Bannon that's appealing yeah. to populist sentiment and attracting people who are struggling. I mean, maybe not as struggling as they are portrayed in, in, in media, but but struggling people nonetheless. Um, and the left is Sanders, I feel like is sort of answering that in a way. And I think, uh, Ocasio-Cortez as well. Um, and, and Jeremy Corbyn, 
but that's important. I mean, that's that's not talked it's, about enough. It's usually important. And I think, you know, I don't want to give Steve Bannon more credit than he deserves because I do think he's kind of a self-promoter. And there's some other words I might say if – I don't know if we can curse on this channel. Oh, by But all uh, means. I'm assuming actually <laughs> – as, I, as I, I was looking around while I said that. I was like, I think I can curse here. Did you see the length uh, of this? Yeah, this yeah. is cursing hair. That's, that is definitely a <laughs> cursing length. I mean, a lot of these guys – I mean, it's not even that deep of a curse, but he's a bullshit artist, right? So even like the right did – really well in these European elections, but a lot of the parties that he was tight with actually didn't necessarily, the one he was most closely identified with in Belgium totally failed. But regardless, it is ironic that far-right, fascistic, authoritarian figures are thinking in way more global terms than most people uh, you know, in, in, in traditional center-left and centrist parties. So I think you're totally right. Part of the answer is definitely a, a, a robust, you know, economic populism. I also think, I mean, I, I think that whole argument of like, why do people vote for candidates like Trump or Bolsonaro? Is it because of like misdirected, you know, uh, anxiety about the economy? Or is it because of just the reassertion of things like racism and so on? I mean, the answer is it's all of the above. Right. I, I love this argument. because it's, it's a, we need to stop. Yeah. It, there, it's, it's all of the above. It's both and. And it's also things like, you know, uh, other types of resentments that don't get talked about. Like I just, you know, uh, Lula da Silva, the former president of Brazil, who in addition to being a political prisoner, because of how he communicates and his record of taking so many people out of poverty is somebody that people could learn from just in the terms of how down to earth he is and charismatic in terms of articulating a left message. It's not so academic. It's not so highfalutin. It's not so posturing. That's a big advantage that Sanders has. But he just said recently, I just, you know, in, in this interview with Glenn Greenwald from prison, he was like making the point that, you know, Glenn Greenwald was like, look, in the specific prison a period, you're president of Brazil, you lifted tens of millions of people out of poverty and the rich, but why did the rich hate you? Like at that time they did really well too. It wasn't like you were taking from them. And he's like, because you should have seen, like, people are saying, like, at the Rio de Janeiro airport, this place looks like a bus station. Why are all these poor people here? And that whole class structure is another area of insecurity and resentment and perceived loss that people have to think about. But the other aspect of taking on the right is, and, and globally, is, is just honestly also having candidates that are clear, concise, powerful communicators that speak to people's interests and and but also their ideals in an unapologetic, no bullshit way. So you see that in Sanders, Warren, and maybe I actually, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't necessarily see, as a communicator, I don't really see it in Warren very much. I mean, I think she's uh, she's got great policy ideas on domestic issues. I think she's a you know I I I, I, I respect and like I her, agree, agree but if we're that. talking communicatively, no, I know I don't necessarily think so. Yeah, I think I think and Warren's I think Tulsi, if you wanted to get there is not globally oriented. I think her, even when she's right, it's coming from a very isolationist perspective, that, not an expansive one. That is true. There is, I, and, and I have to say, there is a bit of an isolationist streak um, on the left, but we are a war-weary nation. I mean, we've been, pretty much my whole lifetime, we've been at war. Um, and I'm, I'm 30, and you know, I'd like to think that I've seen some things, but uh, we have been we have been at war m most of my of my life, certainly my entire adult life, and that is something that weighs on people. Uh, there's a bridge in my hometown named after a kid I graduated with because he uh, heroically died in uh, Ramadi. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I don't I don't fault it, but I do think that it it is something that that is maybe a little myopic. But isolationism, I mean, this even when we accept the premise that being opposed to isolationism means you're supporting of U.S. military action, they've already won. You know what I'm saying? That's so, true. So I 100% agree, like, we need to end any number of military from pulling troops out of Afghanistan to stopping all of these endless drone wars that are happening across the Middle East, South Asia, and Africa, 100%. But there's another dimension of having solidarity with and thinking of different ways that even foreign policy could even work, as an example. You know, like what would a president who even began the small steps of not only pulling back from imperialist wars, but actually started to think in different types of, uh, uh, of terms of how you use U.S. power? Like – because the reality is, is that we affect every single country on the planet. And 
what other things are we doing overseas? You know, when the WikiLeaks cables showed in 2011, uh, I think it was 2011 or maybe it was earlier, that, you know, the state, the, the embassy in uh, Port-au-Prince was pressuring the Haitian government to not raise rages on behalf of Fruit of the Loom. You know, that's U.S. foreign policy, and it's global and it's solidarity for us to coordinate with our colleagues and friends in Haiti to say, no, fuck that. So to me, that's the perspective I'm talking about, and and Sanders has actually been moving in that direction in some ways. So let me ask you, do you see a situation like uh, Syria as an obstacle to to a left-wing internationalist um, movement or, or, or... policy push how so well in in that it's it's something that i think i think most people would agree that the big bad in syria Syria question i'm just gonna drink uh, no it's it's fair enough but the 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 big bad in syria is assad uh and assad's government Mm -hmm. um and arguably from the you know anti-interventionist perspective you you wouldn't be uh involved in that and you can and well, what is that? So this is again. So so one. I mean, obviously, Assyria is very complicated, and that's like a generic thing to say, but it's actually true. So there's multiple <laughs> big bads in Syria. Assad is, in fact, a big bad, and there's some people who I think are kind of invested because they rightly oppose war and oppose intervention with trying to clean his image up. That's not going to work. The guy has a massive body count, right. as do his patrons from Russia. Russia's air campaign there is totally vicious, as do some of the Iranian proxies. Now, by the way, we, the United States, have a massive body count in Syria. Of course. The groups we support have a massive body count in Syria. The groups that the Gulf has supported and the CIA have a massive body count. The only group that I think there is some sense of solidarity with are definitely the Kurdish forces. Those groups should be supported. But again, redefining what this means. Should there be U.S. military action in Syria? No. Can you spend an infinitely more high amount of money to help refugees? Should you be fighting the Trump administration about banning people from this environment from coming to the United States? And by the way, that's something Tulsi voted on in 2014. I'm very concerned about that vote, and I don't buy – in fact – Her explanation of her vote was very honest and forthright, which was that she didn't think there was enough vetting. I totally disagree with that. That's a fundamental difference of view. And I know, again, people get really freaked out and whine about it, but it's like, look, I think that refugees- I am not one of those people. (laughs) You wouldn't be one of those people. But to me, refugees, that's a fundamental commitment. So when we talk about solidarity and and internationalism, one side of it could be, well, we got to push against the U.S., uh, or you know military action because that kills civilians and furthers destabilization. And we've also got to talk about funneling way more money into um, into helping refugees and then also other areas of cutting off arms flows and so on. You know, you go to the beginning of the conflict. Uh, uh, the former South African president Thabo Mbeki had this really interesting perspective. He's like, "Look, when I was negotiating the part of the team negotiating the end of apartheid, you could have had the international system. Uh, of course, like the heads of the apartheid state were guilty of crimes against humanity, but I wanted them there to negotiate with and come up with diplomacy. You know, like I don't want them go hard carted right, off to the Hague. So the truth is, like, we're, there's going to be situations like Syria. Basically, we're going to have to deal, come up with solutions." that are imperfect and flawed and difficult. And that's also the other part of like dealing with foreign policy is you can't be overly moralistic about it either. That's, that's, that's very true. I I think that's a mature perspective. Um, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, talk about at least a little bit how our efforts in Syria have inflamed the conflict and made things worse and acknowledging that and still saying that, you know, Assad is a, a bad He's a, absolutely a butcher. <laughs> well, I mean, that's again, that's an objective was, reality. But what I was yeah. getting at is that these yeah. r- regimes that that uh, kill their own people um, in the hundreds of thousands, th- the response to that is is difficult. It's not because there's always going to be people beating the war drum, and there are always going to be people who want nothing to do with it. And I think that finding a middle ground I- in that uh, and negotiating to protect the people who are vulnerable is is very important and it's something that gets completely lost in we need to totally reject even the idea like the 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 
total misuse of profound, real, and serious things like wanting to combat crimes against humanity to be enlisted in so-called humanitarian intervention. That's one of the greatest things that needs to be totally discarded and thrown out in much of bipartisan foreign policy. Absolutely. Whether we're talking about Libya or Iraq or whatever, I mean, those, those arguments are always used and they're uh, profound misuse and they're wrong. At the same time, I don't think you revert to another position where you sit back and say, well, you right. know, is what it is. The real question is, is, you know, and I think, again, with regards to Syria, uh, you know, why there should be a massive push on refugees, on, 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 on corridors for people. You know, what is happening with Syrians on the, on the Turkish border? Um, how much more money could the United States be investing in resettling, re-educating people, and Why don't you also, think we're seeing that? why don't you think we're seeing there's no that political today? will for that? I mean, we don't have. I mean, look, you think the Trump, look, obviously the Trump administration, yeah, is but totally even on the left, you don't see a lot of that. Well, because I think people also get really invested. You know, look, sometimes there's really important things. It's important to fight war. It's important to oppose military intervention. But then there's whole other sets of concerns that are, you know, less complicated, less sexy, less um, easy to dunk on people with Twitter with. And that's what they involve. They involve, you know, really trying to figure it out. I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm saying that there needs to be a whole space uh, in those areas that are going to really require people think about new ways of actually dealing with them. And, and it could also go back to some, you know, older ideas too, of just like the idea that you, you do take where they can be effective tools, diplomacy, international institutions, seriously to do important work well, outside you, is... of military intervention or simply saying, oh, well, you know, whatever, people can go fuck themselves. See, you're one of the few people who's having this discussion or at least trying to have this discussion. And I think that's what initially attracted me to your show is, is that you, you do talk about this stuff. So, um, It's also a really funny show. It, it, it is a funny show. That's right. I just it's, want to be clear because this has been kind of heavy. It, it has been a little yeah. heavy. We you got me heavy. I that, was joking around. Yeah, no, I know. We start, well, we started the producer. off ki kidding. I and wanted then, to hear more about all, you know, the, Grateful all, Dead and TM and Ella Fitzgerald. And then I know. all of a sudden you got and me, here all, I am. got I'm, me, you got me pissed off, Walker. Well, it's, it's my whole, my whole, my whole uh, life is, is dedicated to just raining on parades. That's, that's it. <laughs> I'm a parade, a uh, parade rainer. Um, I, honestly, is that in your Chiron? Yeah, no. It, well, it does. It does kind of feel like that. Like, like you know, everybody wants to celebrate. Like you know, when Pelosi was doing her like clap and whatnot, right. and it was just like, nope, that actually sucks. And oh, that like I feel like I do that a lot, and it's it's not me. I like to have fun. I'm a fun person. Said. <laughs> Yeah, said, that was said, a very, very fun. Yeah, no, it's a fun thing to say, right? Yeah, yeah. no, no, but, yeah. but it, I mean, come on, you must feel like that too. Like sometimes you feel like you're kind of raining on people's parades. Like everybody, they get so excited about something and you yeah. have to be the voice of... Yeah, Nancy Pelosi sucks. Sorry. Well, <laughs> well not yeah. just not just that. But, but actually, or in this, some of these audiences like Tulsi Gabbard. I mean... It's not your... It, but Peace people get excited warrior, about it. And you sorry. have to be like, well, you, you got to talk about these, the ties to, you know. Yeah, but I think you also do have to, you do also have to just talk about, I think you got to also balance it out with, like what I'm trying to say to people though, honestly, like even like in the Syria thing, to me, yeah, it's hard and it's complicated and it's difficult and it, it involves also just, I think, a huge amount of human pain to just even see that level of suffering, which I think people also need to check in with a little bit because that's very real and, and even just the psychological effects of witnessing that in any type of actual real way, regardless of where you're even coming from politically, people should take note of and be more real about. But I do think, like, look, if there's two basic sides of it, right? If there's like, a, you know, one side is, you know, hey, that's happening over there. There's nothing we could do about it. My heart is closed, whatever. And then on the other hand, there's a little like, oh, yeah, you know, I have no understanding of U.S. foreign policy or NATO or how anything works. And I just saw something happen in another part of the world. Let's go bomb them and figure <laughs> it out and feel good about ourselves, which is just this grotesque, delusional, stupid position to sit and say, wow, all of these models have failed. They don't work. 
they don't produce good outcomes. We have multiple battles we need to fight. We need to understand the market forces at work. We need to understand the geopolitics. And what if there is a new, better way of thinking about, as an example, I keep emphasizing the refugee issue. I think there is actually a positivity to that because you are saying like, look, you don't need to just keep having the same fucking dead repetition about things. There are some possibilities of, you know, I mean, that's even just another thing on my show, too, that I am interested. Like, I, I do think people should know about leaders and, and thinkers from, you know, Africa or Asia or Latin America. And not just in some, like, type of do-goodery nonsense, but, like, there's a whole fucking world out there. And there's actually some really interesting things that are going on, movements, ideas, analysis, leadership, that makes your life better to tap into that shit. That makes you more interesting. That makes you less boring. That makes you like, you know, I mean, honestly, well, if you is- listen to these records, you're probably going to be more interesting than if you're just listening again and again Keep and again. Keep going back to the record. To the same shit. No, you, I'm going to go to the records again in no, the next 15 minute block. No, it's, it's yeah. cool. That's cool. You're ready. No, it, it is cool. I, I, I mean, that's I why I'm doing it. I think you're right. Um, I think that's a good point. Like something that we don't, hear from enough at least in the mainstream conversation about these issues is the perspective of the people who are living there the other day the other day uh a journalist uh actually a couple journalists that i communicate with who are living in uh sanaa in yemen were tweeting about how there were saudi aircraft overhead dropping fucking bombs and like you know when when the awards are doled out when the when and and the dust settles. They're not going to be the ones receiving them, though, but they're, they're not even are heard. The most important, and they're not even heard. And I mean, again, they're not. And it's not even like oh, they're not heard in some type of like heavy-handed moralistic way. It's like literally, the people there are not heard. Well, that's why they're on social media. Yeah, go and check that out. And I really, the work you do on Yemen is incredibly important and it's unbelievable and disgraceful how you know twitter I handled that stumbled into it like i yeah. i always my my yeah. main focus for most of my like i, I want i don't even know how to say this like politically involved life uh has been on on u.s domestic policy um and then there was that article that was like you know do you, msnbc hasn't mentioned yemen in a year and it's like well, right. well what are we missing so i went and then on, on Twitter and just found this just like a ton of, of uh, accounts from, from people who live there who are like, this is our lives. Like, look at this yep. posting videos that by the way, Twitter won't let you post. Um, Disgraceful. And, and so that's, I mean, yeah, that's how, that's how that, that started. I'm like, I'm not an expert on, on, Middle Eastern politics, although now I feel like I've got a very comfortable... And you don't need to be to oppose the U.S. refueling support and coordination it's, of it's, mass murder on a daily basis it's, it's with Saudi genocide. Arabia and the UAE. It absolutely is going... Yes, absolutely. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit from super depressing to slightly less depressing, but also still de- pretty sure. depressing, and that is the state of the opposition party in the United States. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, impeachment and, and whatnot seems to be off the table uh, if you listen to Pelosi and, and at the same time uh, I mean they, they, they passed the DREAM Act which is great mm-hmm. um, but they have a 38 seat majority and it feels like their accomplishments are pretty pretty slim well I mean look I mean, they're, I mean they also passed a really really important massive voting rights package which is both huge HR1 yes so that's <clears throat> huge and they need to keep going in that direction i think the thing with the democratic party though is like it is not a party it, it, it if we were in europe literally it would probably be at least two or three things it's a group factions of people some of which have very little to do with each other there's classes of affluent professionals with liberal social attitudes and some pretty right-wing economic attitudes and a blind faith in technocracy and capitalism. There's traditional labor unions, which are incredibly important, whatever their flaws, they're still like a building block of 
many good things that have happened in this country that are under assault. They represent a dying constituency then that haven't been delivered for and have been undermined, attacked by Republicans and Democratic leaders for decades, right? Well, they're politically convenient. Yeah, and then you have um, people of color, like it's a, and, and other, you know, groups that even in some cases, again, that's another thing that people need to be much smarter about, right? Like there's absolutely some demographics of like people who frankly, like, you know, they might be willing to vote Republican. They might have some pretty conservative politics if the Republicans weren't so fucking racist. So these are a really broad base of people and interests. Then so it is not it a party. It's, a, it's an internal conflict that we're in the middle of, and we have to figure out how to either win – win or but recreate the power balance it's still always going to be a negotiation amongst all but, those forces but why does it feel like the former republicans the uh, the uh the types who would be republican if the republican party weren't um donald trump why does it feel like those folks are always the ones who get to set the agenda well i mean what do you mean <clears throat> by set the agenda so i mean Okay, you mean so, like the people on MSNBC, like because yeah, again, like, I, I, okay. So yeah. I, let me clarify. So when I when I say set the agenda, I mean they're the folks who are in power. That's that's and and if they're not the ones who are in power, then the people who are in power treat them like rare birds. Well, I think this the second thing the, you said is is I don't yeah I think that is true. I think that the Democratic establishment is I mean, but because for a, a number of reasons, right? They aren't. I think it's – one, it's because some people are – they're just not that far apart politically, right? We already know that plenty of people in democratic leadership and institutions have – they take funding from the same, you know, <laughs> Exxon, the United Arab Emirates. They have all sorts of right-wing attitudes and policy sets. The other thing, though, is I also think that, you know, it also comes down to how you understand Trump. And even some people who actually have really good politics – look – it's stupid to not understand how unique and distinct a damaging thing Trump is. And I could just say this on the level of like, as an example, I have a lot of people I'm very close to in the Haitian community, right? That is a fucking difference to have this motherfucker be president, including on horrifying middle of the night, your life is ruined level, right? So it'd be profoundly stupid to not be real about that and insulting to the broader allies in a struggle. On the flip side, you have tons of people and the people who populate these think tanks and, and, and cable news and all of that who they really think, they think this country was hunky-dory until this guy came along. They have no understanding of inequality. They don't care. They, they thought you go to Obama and you have Clinton, and everybody watches HBO Go, and it's cool. They have no structural understanding, including even, it's funny, even on the things they fixate, because to be honest, the stuff like the white supremacy should not be so surprising to you if you knew this country's history. Right. And our politics. Right. And, and, and that's the thing. Like, historic, from, from a historic perspective, this, this is normal for the U.S., like when people say we shouldn't normalize this, I, I take a little, I take umbrage at that. I'm, I'm like, this has kind of been the normal. And is there really much of a difference between coded racism and just outright racism? Because in the end, the racists know you're talking to them. Well, I mean, and like, I, well, I, I used to think that in some ways too. And that's why I always thought Trump would win the Republican primary. And I thought, and you know, whatever. And I even thought, you know, obviously when he was dunking out of the Republicans, it was hilarious to me. <laughs> But the thing is, is and he still cracks me up, which is fucked up. But like, no, it is different well, he's because a troll. He's, a he's a total troll. But it is different because clearly, I think especially amongst group of people, groups of people that have like an authoritarian mindset, the it definitely is a permission granting thing. So you can't not correlate rises and things like hate crimes and stuff with the environment and the template that's set on top. You can't. We're also more aware. Of, of the yeah. I, I think the I think the country as a whole has moved farther, uh, socially at least, left of of where we were in in the nineties. Parts in, of the culture, parts of the culture have moved way. I mean, there's uh, that's a real both ways. I just thing. mean a, ma a majority. 
Like, so, so, and, and, and by that, yeah. like the people who are on television, the, you know, the, we're, we're much well, more. Well, what part of it though? You see, that's the thing is like, I don't, you know, again, sort of like, yes, there's more people who are trying to sound woke on MSNBC or whatever without, with in most cases without much substance. MSNBC, uh, CNN, Fox knew, well, shows see, are more inclusive these days. The, uh, you the, know, I, Fox also didn't have like. The directness of what Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson represent is so much more extreme than that was during the Bush era or even during Obama. And yeah, obviously, culture is changing. Look, it's a paradox. There's no doubt. I'm not sitting here telling you that people are getting worse or better. It's happening in both directions. But the debate about like what it sends to, and signals to people when the person on top is inciting violence at rallies. It's nuts to deny that connection. Well, right. And I was all about in the beginning, like Psh, Mitt Romney said the same shit, whatever. No, it, but it's, it's different. It is. It is. It's it is different. I think. Different I think the rise to of code versus say it. Just like it's frankly different on a positive end for me to be like, I think we should have a more fair society versus like I'm a socialist. Well, right. And I'm here to take all your. But shit. I think. I think. <laughs> like, I don't. I don't know if his. The thing is, I don't know if Trump's statements are any worse than some of the stuff that Nixon said. But I do know that the times are, are such that like that stuff resonates and people latch oh, onto it and people resonate during Nixon. And well, I mean, look, I mean, it resonates. So, super- we have, we have more inequality now than we had during Nixon. We have a greater cultural shift that's happening, a population shift. The, the loss of yeah, a white we majority had, but we is had more of a reality. Like now. white, yeah, but on the flip side, back to your other point, we had like George Wallace winning states in a presidential election during Nixon. So it was hugely resonant during Nixon. And the thing is, is like, and it was resonant during Reagan. Reagan announced his campaign in a place where, yeah, you know, the plan. Yeah, right. So, but. States rights speech. Yeah, but the state, yeah, absolutely. And it was, you know, it was resonant during all of those times. But I think like, I mean, look, if your point there was that quote I heard recently, which said that when people are terrified, they elect monsters to protect them. And I think that there is. That's a good quote. Yeah. Lula. Lula quoted it. Another Lula reference. But uh, yeah, what are you saying? I was just saying that that because of where we're at culturally um, in this unique moment and where we're at in ter- with inequality and uh, populism is, is coming back in a way that. I mean, maybe you could maybe the in the fifties it was still alive, but I, I think that populism really emerged uh, as a f- political force, a major political force after the Great Depression, and sort of started its decline after maybe Harry Truman. But I don't want to say that all of these things are the same populism because I they're not. You know what I mean? Like, and again, it's complicated, blah blah blah. But the truth of the matter is, is like FDR. Yes, it needs to be complicated by a bunch of different things, and he's far from perfect. And but, but at the same time, like let's be real. There's programs that were created at that time because of the labor movement and because of his presidency that are still saving people's lives today. Of course, right? That was a really positive populism. The populism but of on the other of hand, two hundred thousand. I think it was like it might have been less twenty. Thousands of Nazis rallied in New York City at Absolutely. Madison Square Garden. They filled Madison Square Garden. Absolutely. So, so that was it, – it's not no, like the, the other side wasn't there. It's just oh, that the, the left side kind of came to power because we happened to have Hoover before that yeah. uh, who presided over the crash and his response was sort of inadequate. And, oh, yeah. And so – Made but, it worse but now, with austerity, yeah. But now we had uh, a financial crash, not, not as bad, but very bad. Very bad. And we had a president who was a liberal preside over the recovery. And that recovery was not like, it was not enough in so many It was many totally ways. not enough. But I feel, again, it, no, but of course, but again, this is like where so, I'm getting like burned out on all these conversations. Because I feel like even when you go to back to Obama, it's like, okay, people, some, people are so invested in either the fact that Obama bailed out Wall Street, didn't do structural reform, didn't take on inequality in a structural way, let Silicon Valley run amok, all of the stuff that we know that the Obama administration was on a policy level. It wasn't it was not a progressive administration. It did not solve structural problems. 
And other people are super fixated on the fact that clearly having a black president really freaked a lot of people out, including people who, by the way, on the other side of it might not have been as fixated on these issues as they are now. Both of those things are undeniably true, and they're both something we're living with today. They're both real, and people on both sides of the shit, because they slot it, like now, you know, we know the people who are more likely to focus on xenophobia and sexism and racism, they're, they're tending to cluster around, you know, uh, uh, corporate right-oriented candidates, and we know that people who focus on the economic side are, you know, using it to to prop Bernie, but my point is is that it is all of the above. And frankly, even if you had a correct understanding overall historically, even of the of the of both factors, that would still lead you to having left wing politics. It would still be the answer to have a left perspective. It would still be the answer to have some form of real socialism and broader democracy. But the ring the thing that held up socialism historically in this country has been racial division. That has undermined it. If you look at the roots of the Nixon backlash, right. a major part, and it's so important because everybody's sanitized the, it's not, it, the civil rights movement in, uh, of, of King and those people were, uh, those leaders were radical. And they were both talking about the civil rights that everybody has a sense of, which could be jeopardized if we continue with Republicans in power and already have been in voting rights. Oh, absolutely. But it was also that, they were saying, and you looked at those speech, that speech that the I Have a Dream famous speech, the name of that rally was the rally for jobs and justice. The point was, was you guys have a social democracy that exists for white people, and we're going to get in on that yep. as part of a full democracy. So what and what and the that's Nixon when you saw capital, the flight of, yeah, the, of the white there's flight. Class. And so 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 it's both and. And though, and on the flip side, there's other historical examples you can find, like in Reconstruction, where there's actually these amazing multiracial coalitions that deliver great things together. So it's not static, but it's both ends. So how do you break through the noise then? Because I just did. I, well, just <laughs> drop the mic. Don't 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 drop the mic. No, I don't want. I don't, don't want to give this guy a hard time anymore. <laughs> the mic can take it. Oh, okay, great. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, but how do you how do you break through that? Because, uh, I mean, you're you're one voice, and presumably now, two voices. Um, but you have this this fight that's been going on, and you know, I, actually, I think somebody who has been doing this really well uh, is, is Peter Dow. And he, I don't know if you've been paying attention to Peter Dow's. He was on. Uh, I haven't. Been, I was. I was behind the curve, but he was on the majority report last week. So, yeah. But but just people who are saying you know enough, enough with this. But at the same time, I do feel like that impulse uh, has to be tempered by a recognition that like somebody like Biden is regressive. Is Somebody there, like there, Biden, ironically, is is regressive on both sides of what right. people are <laughs> right. you know, talking about. But he's – yeah, I mean, look, I think the problem with Biden strategically is that th – this is actually a commonality, and especially when you – this is when you do have to just look at it as like, hey, we're in New York. We're all talking about politics, and we're you know on these various media kicks, whatever. Nobody that I knew – regardless of whether they were, you know, still with her or or like uh, Bernie didn't, you know, he's not strong enough on Venezuela. They all hate Biden, right? And my thing, and I, of course, I hate Biden too on a political level, but I always said, look. But not as a person. Well, I, actually, you, no, I don't find him that off-putting as a, I mean, whatever, he's, he's an asshole. You're actually. not, but you're not Jennifer Rubin on the, on this. Like he's, he's unappealing as a person. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> I'm not even talking, no, no, no. Well, I'm not talking about, I actually don't really, it's funny because I, part of my job is obviously making fun of a lot of people, but I, a lot, particularly a lot of politicians. To just be honest, don't make fun I of me. I just don't really. I, I don't, don't think I could I take would it. Never. I love I'm way you. too sensitive. Me too. I can totally <laughs> dish, but not take. So I get it. But the, um, but the, but Biden is someone that if you go outside of our circles, he's actually got a charisma that a lot of people find appealing. He's got a. He's got something. Now, I, again, on the flip side, when he's he like came, a hair plug, Han Solo. No. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's not bad. But like Han Solo from the first movie, when he's a mess and super sexist, 
Well, yeah, watch I mean, it again. He's really sexist. I mean, I but I'm I'm saying like I know like I I don't want to like pull like an obvious but like my grandmother likes Joe Biden. Like it's it's not like it's it's if you go to normal people, some of times normal people are wrong and behind the curve. Sometimes we're being nutcases and they're like chill the fuck out and they're right. There there's a lot of people that are just like. Well, I like Joe Biden. He's a plain spoken guy. He says, you know, God bless you. He seems he's nice to his family. And he was he the- worked with Obama. He's a senator for decades. Now, I definitely think Bernie can can defeat him. And I and I don't think and I think on the other hand, how high he came out was also misleading. But people were not understanding because one of the tricks of this job, which is the is funny because we're always arguing with and dunking on and blah, blah, but you have to sit back at times and just be like, why does somebody want something? Even if I totally don't get it or even find it repulsive. Well, do you ever find, do you ever find speaking of sitting back, do you ever so find Biden's that, tough? Well, yeah. I mean, he does, he does have his a- appeals, I guess. Well, I look, admit not it. to us, not to uh, us. I'm no. talking in the, fi- look, if he was what people like us perceived him as, he would be less than one percent in the polls. Like it, it just again, it just that's, he, there that's, was you know name. There's the name recognition. There's absolutely the name and recognition. There's the, and there and he's he's got a little bit of a swagger, but he I feel yes. like he's kind of emulating the the Trump style, like no shame, no apologies. I just come out and he's I'm, always been like you know, that. He's been hey, like that you for youngs, decades. You young people. I, but again, you're getting fixated know, on what? Yes, he's an asshole. <laughs> But if you want to beat him, that doesn't do anything. No, it doesn't. Right? Like, what? how do you focus on him strategically? What is going to be the most effective? Who's interviewing who I, here? You know, I should uh, be asking you these I'm asking questions. rhetorical questions. Yeah. They're not aimed at you, though. No, but... but like, I, I would say, like, if you go to, like, a place like like uh, like a, one of these states that you need to flip back from Trump, and you go and you say, like, Joe Biden said this, and he has no empathy, and then it's like, Psh, whatever. Don't, okay, great. Right, go back to Twitter. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> he voted for NAFTA. He right. made permanent normalized trade relations with China. So when he comes in here and he's all like, I just got back from the fire hall, you say, right, did you just get back from the fire hall when you were pushing TPP, motherfucker? Right. That, that will work. Right, the policy. With people who are, it's not just the policy, it's the policy that has fucking exported jobs out of somebody's town, not something that people are going to, you know, you know, including things that are right, like the Hyde Amendment. That's a big thing. Oh, it's that's huge. a huge thing yeah. that women are rising in this party and 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 You've resisting got a guy who supports this, the Hyde this Amendment. terrorism of women that's happening across the South. And the dude is backing the fucking Hyde Amendment. Like that. That's, well, that's something. I, do you think he's kind of a paper tiger? I mean, do you? I can't. I can't. It's t- to me. I always well again. He's a paper tiger relative to the way he came out. There's no way he's going to be that strong. But I wouldn't be surprised if it comes down to him and Sanders. I do think he's still the most likely of the center-right candidates to dominate. Who else do you include in that category? Of people that I think could be good? No, center-right candidates. Uh, In the sense that I use it, uh, I would say Booker is center-right, Gillibrand is center-right, Maybe they're centrist. Maybe I should say centrist. What do you think uh, of Buttig- Harris? Uh, Harris would, to me, be uh, in the center. I mean, I think we need to rebrand the way we use these terms. Obviously, I think AOC's pointed that out on like what actually is popular. Uh, but may- actually, may- maybe if you want to say like Booker and Harris and Gillibrand are in the center of this equation, and Buttigieg and Biden are on the center right. Actually, because, you know, those three have like they've made their move on Medicare for all. I don't think it's necessarily sincere, but but it's different. Right. I mean, Buttigieg and Biden have made a point of not doing that. That's a very different approach. O'Rourke, too. Yeah, I I don't even. (laughs) Hey, man, he was born for this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that's really insulting. Like. I was born to have a 4% uh, poll number and embarrass myself <laughs> and speak in gibberish. It's like, all right, hey, hey, that's at sad. Least, at least he's going to skate in, you know. He's just, I mean, run for Senate, bro. But, but, run for Senate. But, but do, should you? I mean, yeah, he should. 
I wouldn't vote for him, but that absolutely <laughs> is what he should do. I mean, this whole presidential thing is just fucking delusional. Just going back to the house. Sure. Yeah, go, back to the go back to the house. Go back to the strip mall your mom bought for you or whatever the fuck it is that you came <laughs> from. I don't know. Go, 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 so, do, do something else. <laughs> go read yoga journal. Take up knitting. Yeah. yeah. I think he's a little more active than that, the jerks. Yeah. I don't know if he could knit. He seems very antsy. I'm going to tell you something right now. It's yeah. very important. Yeah. I feel it very strongly yeah. in my bones. We're here at Pace Studios. <laughs> so excited. <laughs> There's records. <laughs> I'm going to move my chair. Can I move my chair? <laughs> no, no, no. No, bro. You got to stand on your chair. Oh, right. I gotta, I'll be out of frame if I did that. That's like, by the way, that was I so, would do it, but, you know, that was so yeah. insulting to President Obama. I have to say that people would compare his speeches to Obama's was fucking nuts. Like, hey, but at one time he was in the band with the lead singer from At The Drive-In. Well, that was, well, no, that's not really cool in my world. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right, I guess. No, but he I mean he would come out and whatever you thought of Obama, Obama had, you know, and speed like A uh, equal, uh, to B to C, and that's why we need to come together. You know, and right then, now, let right me right be now, clear. Let me be clear. And then O'Rourke, they're like, he's like the white Obama. He sounds like Obama. And I watched him and, and I literally Maybe we don't need a white Obama. I, we don't need but but you would watch him give a speech, and the dude was like, I think, I think Malika Jabali, I want to say, was like, his speeches sound like it's 3:30 a.m. and it's finals, and you're right, and you're just like, and that's why democracy and purpose and greatness, and and it's a good, and I'm so excited. And you're like, that's not what Obama sounded like, ever. No. No, like, like I mean, it's just a, it was like it was like Obama crescendo to his like. There's no this and that, and there's no da da da. And he would and we can do work. Just come a work. It's like he already hears the chariots of fire music in the back of his head before like anything is even started, and he's already freaking out. <laughs> just like, dude, <laughs> stop! What are you doing? Uh, well, listen, in the, I I do want to wrap up, but the in the last you know few seconds uh, that I have you. Um, your thoughts on, on, on Warren, I want to go back to that really sure. quickly. You said that she's not a great communicator. I tend to agree with that, but there are a lot of people who find her very inspiring. Do sure. you think that that would, that, that Warren is, do you think that she could beat Trump? Um, yeah, I, I, I look, I, but again, to be honest with you, if Trump is in the right position, I think even people that I really don't like could probably beat Trump. Like, I think to be honest, like Bernie, I think would have definitely beat Trump in 2016. At the same time, if Joe Biden ran, he would have beat Trump. Like some of that was, and this is another thing that people don't like in politics. Definitely. He would have beat Trump. I don't know if I agree with that. Cause not after of, Sanders run, not after Sanders run. If only because the when that conversation happened, I mean that was the right time for those conversations about Medicare for all, about fifteen dollars. But you know what wage. you're underestimating, in in to some extent, and this is and it sucks and it's for better or for worse. But there's all some people always want to talk about policy and ideology. Other people want to talk about identity and all that stuff is important. But there's another part of politics that's just like, are you good at that shit or not? Are you a good campaigner? Do you know how to do a speech? Do you know how to get out there and whatever? And so, anyways, I'll get back to Warren. But I think counterpoint yeah. to that, sorry, is that he copied and pasted in his climate plan. So talking about good campaigning. I mean, this nobody is, cares. No, I that's like the I, classic I know, example. I know, I know, dude. I know. I'll but use at the that same to hit, dude. Time, like, go on, out, go outside of this building. This 19, it ruined go, this 1988 campaign. Go, You're gonna do it well, again. That, no, that was different. I know it was different. Dude, no, same, no, this is a good example. No, this is a people. great example. If okay. you went downstairs, right. <laughs> no, this is a really good example. This is a really good example. If you went downstairs and you stopped 20 normal people going about their business and you said, "Hey, there's a dude who's running for president who took somebody else's biographical." story and presented it as his own what do you think about that they'd be like that's pretty oh, fucking no, weird who is that and then you went down you're like hey hey did you know that he used somebody else's climate change language but on his con- website they'd be like get the fuck it, out no, of my it's, face it's i have a life to it's live context. leave me alone you freak no, it's, dude it's nobody, cares. Like, nobody cares right. nobody cares nobody cares nobody cares i'm sorry nobody cares 
you care. I barely even care about I mean, that I one. Don't, I don't really. I, just, I think. I, hang on. No, I care. No I care normal more people about, care about that. Shit. I care more about. The I care about where he is, got it from. He picked some of it from a, a, a right leaning place. Uh, you know, uh, I care that's more about a the problem. Fact that he, he's getting informally advised by somebody who was sitting on the board of a, a you know liquid national there natural you gas company. And you should but, work to make people care about that. But I, but I nobody will say cares that, about the that, website but policy. But when it comes to that, that reminds it, it. You know. It, as George Lucas says, it it, it rhymes. It, it you know it, it rhymes. <laughs> and at this point, the woman is rhyme. like, "I really can't help you, young man. Thank you, thank you." And she's running away. <laughs> but anyway, back to Warren really yeah. quick. And then I think I, she then could. I'm I think she. Up. I know we got to go. I I think she could beat Trump, and she's the only person. You know, she's my second choice to Bernie. Even though I really, I think her foreign policy is like actually abominable. Oh, which it's terrible! I, like abominable, terrible. atrocious foreign policy. But I don't think uh, that, no, I mean, bluntly, I get why people find her inspiring. I, I, res- I like her and I respect her. No, she does absolutely does not. I would not go into the campaign with, say, again, I'm just talking politically. I think Bi- Bernie's both right and I totally am confident he could beat Trump. And then there's somebody like Harris who is not what we need politically. But I'm like, you know what? There's somebody who's got some... She's got some charisma. She knows that, like, I would not have that same confidence with Elizabeth Warren. I wouldn't. So. As a, as a communicator. I don't, I don't necessarily agree. I think, I think I, Warren I saw is, that one coming. I think Warren I is, that, a, I think Warren. Because all of her website policy stuff is original. <laughs> no, tell me, tell me, tell me. No, you think, you think Warren is. No, I, I don't think. Maybe she, Harris is too full of shit. I, yeah, it could be a problem. I, I, I think that, yeah. I think Trump would steamroll both of them a uh, warren or harris yeah i, I warren is probably you know it, i'm not but, i'm not i'm purposely not yeah. doing endorsements this election um but you're not going to endorse bernie i'm not going to endorse Dude, any candidate stop i'm not endorsing any candidate so no it, 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 look look i like sanders if you, if you i like warren i i i actually don't mind harris I'll be honest. I, I know that, I, you know, I, I dug up those videos and everyone's like, why do you hate her so much? I'm like, I, you know, I don't hate her. So you don't have to hate her. It's, it's just important. useful information. That's yeah, important information. I don't hate everybody who laughed about sending the parents of true kids to jail. <laughs> I just would like to know that they laughed at that. <laughs> it's just useful information. But I, I, I do think that Trump is in a much better position than people are willing to Why do you think that, though? Because traditional economic indicators are pretty good. Um, because the Democratic Party doesn't seem to want to challenge him. But wait a that second. Those economic indicators but wait, aren't hold up. enough. Yeah, see, that's true. I agree with you. But what I look and because he's been campaigning since he's been in office, he's yeah. been holding rallies around the country since he's been in office. The big thing with Trump and what makes him in really big trouble, and I still and all the shit that we need to do needs to happen regardless. And Trump could totally win re-election, so 100 percent. Don't be complacent. But when you saw in 2018 those. Those key states that he won, like Wisconsin, that tanked on them. And I just saw a piece in Politico two days ago saying that Trump has like a new strategy about like, well, maybe we're going to win. We're going to lose Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, but we're going to win New Mexico and New Hampshire, which are states that Republicans have not won in a very long time. That's a sign of a lack of confidence. And they're poorly strategically placed. So, again, well, he's done nothing. He has done nothing to help people. Of course In not. fact, he's he's done the opposite. He's hurt people. He's so hurt people I, a ton. So look, dude, if you look, I think to me, it's like the last thing I'll say about this is that if we said that there was like 80,000 people that were geographically important because of where they're located that voted for Trump in a place like Michigan because they bought his scam about trying to help them with jobs, those people are done. So they're either not going to vote for him and just not vote or they're going to vote for a Democrat. And that, honestly, what's so funny about this is that that is literally all you need. I have the most confidence that Bernie will deliver that. And I also, but my support of Bernie is bigger than, like, we need to do the agenda he's talking about to see off Trump and Trump-like things for decades. And that's the bigger picture. Well, I hope that you're right. And I really appreciate you joining us in the Pace studio. Check out Michael Brooks' show and check him out on Twitter and just check him out. Um, My pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And, uh,